Hi, my name is Shanice Lawrence and I am a Canadian with a background in Jamaica as well as St. Vincent and I'm a part of the LGBTQ plus community and I realized I don't know very much about my own history. I created Activism History because I wanted to know why it is so important to protest, riot, and advocate for your rights when you are not being heard. I wanted to dig deep into history and arm myself with the knowledge that is out there so I could understand what activism really means. Knowledge is power, and we can use it to create a better world for all. A little disclaimer before we begin. I did not go to school for history, I am not a history major, I decided to proactively search the same web that I'm so quick to purchase items or food from to learn more about why things are the way that they are. I've included many links below if you're interested in self-study like I am. I encourage you if you have any additional knowledge or if you'd like to fact check anything that I relate to you to please write it in the comments below. I'd love to hear from you and I think learning should always be a collective effort. So let's learn together. So the Stonewall Rebellion or Uprising or Riot as it is called is a pivotal moment in LGBTQ plus history that gave birth to the gay liberation movement. Let's start with the TLDR for all my Reddit lovers out there who like their sto history short and sweet. Then we'll go deeper to see what was really happening before as well as what's happening now in the world concerning this. The Stonewall Rebellion took place on June 28, 1969 in New York City, New York at the Stonewall Inn, a bar in Greenwich Village. The event ignited when New York police officers started dragging patrons and employees out of the bar during a routine raid that was common to many LGBT car bars at that time. This rebellion sparked six days of protests and riots as the community had had enough of injustice at the hands of law enforcement, the government, and the general public who denied their existence and looked down on them. Still with me? This event was momentous in the fact that it marked the first time a violent scuffle had taken place with no less than law enforcement in the fight for our rights. It shocked the nation and made a dent in history as we know it. So let's get into a little bit about how we got to this point. Before this moment in 1969, the LGBT community, as it was known then, was heavily discriminated against and heavily oppressed. It was never seen as okay to be gay. The community was ostracized from every facet of modern day life just for being themselves. Being gay was criminalized as well as medicalized for anyone who dared to show their true self. In fact, a lot of the laws against the community were due to a heavy culture of religion, the patriarchy, and an unwillingness to separate sexuality and sexual acts. Gay bars and clubs are deeply ingrained in the roots of the community as earlier on they became safe havens for those who wanted to fully express themselves in public. The Stonewall Inn was run by the local mafia and although it is widely dis disputed as being a pil pillar of that community, the fact remains that it was where people wanted to be at that time. So what happened that night exactly and who was it that threw the first brick or drink? It's still unclear. What is clear is the New York Police Department was being paid by the Mafia to keep them up to date on local raids. On the night of June 28, 1969, no tip came in to warn the patrons or employees of this bar. As they were being dragged out and into the car of law enforcement, many witnesses remember a butch, gender non-conforming woman fighting back against the NYPD officer who was handling them aggressively. This act inspired others around them to leap into action, spurring a riot that burned six days of protests and riots in the name of equality. The message was clear, enough is enough. A word on Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera. In watching interviews done by people who were actually at Stonewall during this rebellion, I cannot in good faith perpetuate a lie. Marsha P. Johnson herself stated on Obtained Audio that she did not arrive at the rebellion until well after two and could not have thrown the first brick that cited the incident. Similarly, her friend Sylvia Rivera mentioned she could not claim throwing the first drinks that also incited this event. This doesn't make their legacies any less important, but it is important to tell it like it is. 
So, on the anniversary of this event, June 28th, 1970, the very first Pride Parades took place in New York, Los Angeles, and San Francisco. These parades were not full of giant corporations who wanted to pull a pride flag on their window or alcohol companies who wanted you to party with a drink later. They were filled with very brave men and women who recognized the need to have their rights heard and acknowledged by people who sought to ignore and demean them. Canada had their first parade in 1971 in August. Now let's take a second and breathe. How are we feeling? If you can, please take a moment to donate to one of the many LGBTQ plus organizations who ensure safety, encourage community, and fight for the rights of all in the description box below. You can also help but the cause by volunteering your time locally, being an ally when situations come up against LGBTQ plus people, and just remember that the fight is not ever over as long as discrimination persists to end the rights of LGBTQ plus people worldwide. Now, I want to shift the history lesson to a special word, context. Context is the circumstances that form the setting of an event, statement, or idea, and in terms of it can be fully understood and assessed. When we're talking about protests and riots, we also talk about the context that surrounds them. The appropriate question to ask is always, what led to people having to protest and riot for their lives? What caused this? The answer is many things. There were many notable moments in LGBTQ plus history. In 1897, Magnus Hirschfeld, a German man, founded the Scientific Humanitarian Committee in May of 1897 in Germany. In 1924, Henry Gerber, a German immigrant, founded the Society of Human Rights in Chicago, Illinois. The Mattachine Society, one of the earliest LGBT organizations for human rights, was founded in 1950 in Los Angeles. So this seems great on the outside, but for the context of this situation, it is important to note that sodomy was still, for the purposes of the law, very much an illegal act until 1962. Sodomy was defined under the law as illegal sexual acts of anal sex, oral sex, and bestiality. It is not a coincidence that the two former were lumped with the latter under the law. Sodomy was officially eliminated from the law in Chicago, Illinois on January 1st, 1962, 38 years after the Society for Human Rights, 12 years after the Mattachine Society, and seven years before Stonewall. Also, in some good news for 1962, the Tavern Guild, the first gay business association, was also created by gay owners gay bar owners and liquor wholesalers who wanted to in battle against police discrimination, the local liquor board, and the aforementioned sodomy laws, as well as general public malaise. And it continues. Illinois was the very first state to abolish its sodomy laws. It inspired 19 more states to repeal their sodomy laws throughout the following 1970s. However, the most notable fight was in California. They had six years worth of battles to repeal these laws, and even in the wake of a final victory, two prominent candidates were murdered in cold blood by a member of their own council at the time. Their names were Harvey Milk and George Moscone. But let's rewind a bit because lesbian rights are just as important to the story. The first lesbian rights organization founded in the US of A was the Daughters of Bill Idist on September 21st, 1955. It was founded in San Francisco by an activist lesbian couple whose names were Del Martin and Phyllis Leon. So we connect the dots. New York is where Stonewall takes place, California fights six years of battles to have sodomy repealed, and the Mattachine Society is founded in Los Angeles, while the Daughters of Bill Itis are founded in San Francisco. This is why those three cities are the very sites of the very first Pride Parades. What else led up to the happenings in 1969? Just because a law is repealed does not mean people are safe. What happens time and again in situations of toxic and discriminatory laws being repealed is the view of who it helps. When the sodomy laws were pulled out of the law, more hatred spread into the general consciousness. Most notably, the police. 
The New York Police Department was constantly raiding the bars of LGBT areas at their own will and also at the direction of the Liquor Authority Board who did not want to sell to openly gay patrons because they deemed them unsavory. They were also being paid by the Mafia to alert them of raids as they owned most of the gay bars in Greenwich Villages. So the police were corrupt far beyond the night of 1969 and the Mafia was free to take advantage of the situation as they saw fit. Now, if you're anything like me, you were shocked to hear that the Mafia was involved. The fact is, they were. Gay clientele were shunned and shamed by the rest of society, forcing them to become the fringes. The people who showed up time again in these situations are the mafia as well as other organized crime. It is documented that by the mid 1960s, the Genovese crime family controlled most of all of Greenwich Village gay bars. The Stonewall Inn was purchased in 1966. It was renovated in less than a year and then opened to the gay public. And when I say renovated, I mean the term very loosely. For those who went to the bar, it was anything but upscale as the sign-in sheet made it seem. It was run down, there was no running water, there was no working toilets, and the drinks were watered down. The bar was technically legal, but subject to subsequent raids that only decreased because the mafia paid the local NYPD to alert them. That is the definition of a group being taken advantage of. The good news in this is that activism was not an uncommon occurrence. On April 21st, 1966, a sip-in was organized by the Mattachine Society. They had learned this tactic from earlier protests. They would have members go into local bars and taverns, declare that they were gay, and wait to see if they were still served. If they were not served, they would sue the tavern or bar, and they were legal geniuses about it. And all this led to the Stonewall Rebellion, a pivotal moment in time. But what happened after? And what of right now? After Stonewall and the first Pride Parades, life was not easy, but more consciousness was brought to the general stage. The more people know about an issue, the wider the doors can open for allies in all places. And for a while, everything seemed like it was moving toward a new normal. Until the AIDS epidemic caused the movement to shift from gay rights to avoiding death by deadly disease. This shift in the movement put a noticeable drain in the fight for equality as they fought for the government's aid and attention. I recommend watching the many documentaries and shows dedicated to showing the truth of how slow and ignorant the government was to aid the community from the early 1980s in its discovery and wrongfully pegged as a gay disease in its first year to the 90s when the CARE Act was signed to help improve the availability of and access to care for low income, uninsured and underinsured people affected by HIV AIDS and their family. The fight to end AIDS is still being fought today with the projected end of the epidemic listed as 2030. So pride is not only a celebration of what it is to have pride in yourself, in your community and the freedom to be yourself. It is also a look into the activism that has helped us all be the best versions of ourselves because we all deserve to be seen, respected, and supported by our elected officials and public servants. I hope that you've learned a lot because I really did when researching this. The biggest takeaway is that the fight lives on. Many cities in the U.S. and countries around the world still do not have rights for the LGBTQ plus community. In many places, it is still seen as illegal, immoral, and evil. In many places, people are still dying, being persecuted for, and even hate themselves for who they are. Please take some time to donate your money or your time locally to any links in the description box. And if you are a member of the LGBTQ community or an ally, happy pride!